talk to you today and hear from you because I only want to talk for a little bit and then I want to hear from you because what, you've, what you find fascinating, what you find interesting, I find fascinating. But I have learned over a period of time that when you talk to an audience, it's important to establish your bona fides. Is that all right, Barry? Right? And so I just want you to know for a fact, I am. A shoe, right? You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. I actually wear it, but it makes me walk with a hitch. This, this piece of wood on the bottom is, is really problematic. The, um, but I do want to talk to you today, and I want to talk to you about the optimized fleet response plan. Now, um, people are going, hey, it's the FRP. How many times have we done the FRP? It's about the fourth time I've done the FRP. So I haven't gotten it right, so I'm now try trying it on the fourth time. And this is what we want to talk to you. And it's important we talk to you here because we're rolling it out formally for the first time to understand what this optimized FRP and what it is not. Um, uh, this slide is one of my favorite pictures I've seen in a long time. It's the Bush Strike Group. Uh, it wasn't very good weather out there. But uh, what I like about this, uh, there's an there's a, um, uh, LA class and a Virginia class. You just can't see it in there. And there's a P-8 that the weather's so bad, but that's what makes our Navy the best Navy in the world, is the combination of that capability that's out there. And it's great to be able to hear, and uh, I wish you could have gone out there and seen that. We've done so much with our advanced phase. Let's take the slide first. Of course, I have to talk about the readiness kill chain. I want to bring you up to speed. I, we rolled the readiness kill chain out here a year ago at SNA, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the differences. I'm sure everybody has, uh, understands the readiness kill chain, has it tattooed on their chest. Um, I, know, I know that the Sea Lord does, but I want to talk to you. It has evolved over the last year, and I want to talk to you about how we changed it. The first change that we made on the readiness kill chain is we moved the ends all the way over here to the deployability and the sustainability phase. If there's one thing that's really important about the kill chain, it's, it's all about means, ways, and ends, and it's aligning the whole Navy to the same end state, to the, whole, to the same set of ends, which is the CNO sailing directions, uh, we're fighting forward ready, and it's our deployability and our sustainability. Everything we do is to get things on point, to get them deployed and use them in a sustained so they can do the nation's bidding. The next thing is, so everything else now in the ways piece is all aligned up over here. So all the elements of the FRP and everything starting back at resourcing and policy coming out here is all part of the ways. The next thing we did is we, we've added a bunch of our means. If you look in there, um, everybody's familiar with the pesto pillar. The, uh, the stuff that you need in order to produce readiness, we have added to it because we learned that there are a lot more means than just the, than the pesto pillars. First is, is our, uh, our, our networks. We can't communicate. We can't plan a party without our networks, right? So that tells you how important our networks are. The networks are part of it. Our installations, Naval Installations Command, are absolutely critical because they not only sustain our families and our sailors, they, they have the fields, the airfields, the ports, the piers. We can't do our job without installations. And over the past budget years, we were trying to take money out of our budget, what little we had, to fill those gaps in that Naval Installations Command as they were taking, we think, too much risk, and it was affecting our ability to produce readiness. Yeah. Is that Bill French out there or somebody from, uh, yeah. The, uh, I did get a Christmas card from him, I tell you, that was quite a shock. Anyway, but uh, the community, the community is a part of the means. We come from the community. We are the school teachers. We are the, the little league coaches. We, our children go to the schools. The community is a key part. They take care of our families while we're on deployment. And, and reaching out to our community uh, and, and uh, telling them how important it is is absolutely critical. Industry, how many people in industry, raise your hand here. You are a part of our means. You know, we cannot... You are, you are the second great secret behind how effective soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and coast guardsmen are is because you all give us terrific product, and then we have the, the very best of the youth of America. We give them the necessary training, which is our, which is our strategic advantage, is our training, uh, that we're able to go forward. So you are a mean uh, on how we do business. And finally, we added our elected leadership on there. And why did we do that? They're the bankers. And, and so, um, you know, you know we've got to remember that most of our elected leadership have never been in the military. So it's our job to educate them, not to wank, not to, not to do it, but to educate them on our needs, what we do, and why they're so important to us. And so all of that are part of the means. The last thing is the weapon system. You saw two key pieces of the weapon system in the previous slide. The weapon system 
isn't your early Burke. It isn't your F-18. It isn't your Joint Strike Fighter. It's the compilation of all the things that you see over there. It's the ships. It's the airplanes. It's the submarines. It's our C-4 ISR and our cyber. It's Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, and it is our operational and tactical headquarters. It's the compilation of those capabilities and the training of those capabilities that makes our weapon system, make our Navy effective. None of, none of our Navy can do any of that without each other. Okay? And so educating people, especially our force, it's great that we're raised in tribes, but you are a part of a larger tribe, it's the United States Navy. We were all naval officers before we were naval aviators or surface warriors. Embrace that fundamental fact of life. I want to talk about operational and tactical headquarters. Some people call those staffs, but we in the Navy hate staffs. We really do. We think staffs are bad. Uh, but, it's, uh, but, we, but the operational and tactical headquarters, operational starting at the naval, naval component, okay, our, our numbered fleet commanders and, and pack fleet, all the way down to our, uh, all the way down to our units, our, our strike group staffs, our composite warfare commanders and their staffs, they're the operational and tactical headquarters because it doesn't matter how good the individual ship or airplane it is, it's those staffs that do the planning, execution, and assessment that put the plan together that take that weapon system and make sure that the stuff and the sailors can do their nation's bidding. Readiness kill chain is really important. We've learned a lot this past year, most of it, looking at areas where we've had barriers and the breaks in the kill chain and, uh, uh, and how, what barriers we need to knock down. No one has embraced the kill chain harder in the Navy than the surface warfare community and Sea Lord, thank you very much for that. It's really going after and we need to go after. Right now though, we're still looking too much as we have a problem. We look at what are the barriers. We look at the root cause. We look at the horizontal and vertical communication required uh, all the way back on where an issue may start. We need to start using the kill chain in a predictive fashion. Where will those barriers be if we don't go close those, go close those necks down? Okay, slide please. I also talked a lot about the work that, that the surface warfare community has put in place to make themselves better. And this is the progress that's occurred over the last year. Incredible effort. Once again, everything they do, taking the kill chain analysis for every single, every single one of your warfighting platforms, where are the barriers, what are the common barriers, and we're going after them in a big way to try and fix them. None of them can come quick. All the low-hanging fruit, we've done that. This is, this is going to take a lot of hard work over many years to get us where we need to be. You see the increased uh, enlisted, uh, enlisted leadership. Um, we're returning, put, putting sailors at the right place at the right time, on the waterfront, into the schoolhouses, into our inter intermediate uh, maintenance efforts. We're trying to uh, uh, a huge improvement to uh, in-serve and aligning our inspection process to FRP. More on that later. The class maintenance plan, the surf, uh, the surf map, unbelievable effort. You, can, you just have to be on a ship that's gone through that particular cycle and see the improvement. And you can see it, uh, uh, the quantitative improvements through the in-serve inspections. And then a warfighting focus, putting WTIs on your ships, training WTIs. The, uh, the schoolhouse, that the, uh, the, 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 the governance structure that develops sailors, surface warriors, sailors and officers in the future, it's going to be unbelievable. And then integrated live fire, and we'll show you some of that report. And the, and the successful introduction of LCS on its first deployment as we uh, replace all of our small craft, because we've had a high-low mix our entire Navy, and LCS is going to do great things for us. All right, that's, that's what we want to talk about. But now let's move on. I want to talk to you about uh, optimized FRP. But first, we have to give you the prototypical slide that has the CNO sailing directions. It's really important for you junior officers out there this is, this is butt snorkeling that works, okay? I mean, look, all right? I mean, I don't put up a slide that I don't put this up there, but I really like it because it's about today's navies and investments in today's navies to make sure that tomorrow's navies can fight and win. 65 to 70% of today's Navy, of the Navy of 2025, whether it floats or flies, we already own. So we need to make investments today and today's readiness or investments and modernization in today's Navy is going to make sure that that Navy can fight and win in 2025. Now we're going to operationalize. This is his commander's intent. You know, you get two things right. You get commander's intent and you get a clean chain of command. Most things will work out for it. It'll work out okay. As far as I know that this is the best commander's intent I've ever received. It's simple. I understand it. And we're going to go out to it. We operationalize that through the fleet response plan and what, we're going to call, what we call now the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, and we do that using the kill, readiness kill chain process. You can see uh, in his position report, 
um, of 2013 on page three. Uh, he talked about we developed the optimized fleet response plan. When I read it, I said, boy, I wonder what that is. Um, uh, but uh, no, really, we worked pretty hard on it for a long time. And now we're going to talk to you about the optimized fleet response plan. Very pay attention. This is really important. Next slide, please. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> no. OK, next slide. You know, the first thing you need to do when you want to look at, look at something is analyze and agree on what the problem is you're trying to fix. So in every one of my briefs, everybody has to come to me with, what's the problem we're trying to fix? All right? Are we trying to do change for change's sake, or are we trying to fix? And we all have to agree on what the problem statement is. And we tried to capture uh, uh, of problems and how we produce readiness and the fleet response plan. It's not necessarily that it's the free, fleet response plan is just a name that we use today. We used to call it the interdeployment training cycle. We used to call it 20, the, the turnaround training plan. Uh, what else did we used to call it? I mean, it's been a ton of names. Today, we call it the fleet, fleet response plan, and it is the force generation model, the readiness force generation model for the United States Navy. The Marine Corps has one that looks just like it. It's, the, it's their BCT, the, uh, BCT force generation model. Okay? It's how we produce readiness. Okay? And what's happened here over time is that we've lost, the single biggest problem that I see out there is that we've lost predictability in, our, in the way we generate, uh, generate readiness. Okay? And it's cost predictability for our sailors. It's lost predictability for, the, for our families. Our industrial base doesn't have the predictability it, need, it needs that he'd give us the best product for the best cost, for the least cost. And for those of us that are in the production of readiness, we've lost that predictability. And uh, I used to be a consumer of readiness. I'm here to tell you it was a lot more fun to be a consumer. But, um, uh, or the product, to be honest. But uh, uh, for both the producers and the consumers of readiness, they've, we've locked our ability to give them that predictability. So the one thing we want to put in here is that we want to put predictability back into our force generation model. The next thing, the length. The length has grown over time. It's always going to grow over time. Uh, given the complexity of our, of our combatants that we have out there today, but between the maintenance and training and our ability to generate an acceptable A sub O with a good purse tempo for our sailors is lacking. Okay? It's got a misaligned chain of command predominantly because our, our, the units of the weapon system, the elements of the weapon system, all are on different FRP lengths. Okay? So if you try and schedule to align people to the same focus area, it doesn't work because they haven't been on the same force generate the weapon system uh, or the element of the weapon system that, are, that work up and train together are not all on the same FRP cycle. Lastly, largest readiness degrader that we have out there is manning. Okay? Doesn't matter how good the stuff is if the people aren't there and they're not properly trained. Okay? And not only do they have to be on the ship or in the squadron, they have to be there at the right time. If they show up after the training occurred and just before deployment, it's not, it's not going to work. And that's where we are today. Second, let, the next one is the maintenance and modernization. I'll tell you, we're not executing on time on budget. We're not getting them in on time. We're not getting them out on time. The, the planning effort is not as synchronized nearly as, mu as well as it should be. And we're going to have to go out there and fix that. The next one is the, uh, the spares. If I don't have the spares on the shelves, if I haven't ordered them two years ago or three years ago, in many cases five years ago, they're not going to be there. So we got to get the spares right. The inspection process is completely unconstrained. And at the Operational Tactical Headquarters, there is no standardized uh, 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 academic, synthetic, and live training at the Operational and Tactical. It is by happenstance and is not at the discipline that we, in, in, in this time and, time and place in the world, that we know we have the ability to put in. So that's the problem statement that we're trying to fix. Does everybody agree with this problem statement? Anybody want to take issue with it? Go ahead, free shot at a four star if you don't. Is there anybody that wants to add anything to it? I could add another two or three pages, but we try and capture it in that. Okay, so now that we all agreed on the problem, let's go see how we're going to go out and fix it. Slide, please. What are the potential drivers to the readiness production? Now, we're starting the optimized FRP with the carrier strike group. Okay, now why are we doing that? Because if we get the carriers, the air wings, and, uh, and all the squadrons, and all of the crew des that support that, that's 85% of our Navy. So if we put the right stuff in place, we're going to be okay. 
But up on the upper left-hand shelf, upper left-hand shelf is the traditional Devo definition of an FRP cycle. That's the way it should look. We're down in maintenance, we work up, and then we go on deployment and readiness declines as we go, go down there. That's theory. That's not reality. But that's what we try to achieve. But if you look, there's different drivers to this. And if you look on the upper right-hand side, it's the Truman Strike Group, where because of budget, we trained her, and then we didn't deploy her. And we kept her ready for deployment, and then we pushed her out the, deploy, out the door, and she's right about right here now. She didn't fit within the traditional cycle, but we invested in, her, in their readiness. They were actually two days away from deployment, and we delayed them because uh, we made a, a secretary made a decision uh, because of sequestration. On the lower left-hand side is another one. It's a Nimitz one, and this cost driver was maintenance and schedule problems. This was supposed to be the cycle. She's working up, but then she had, was it a reactor cooling pump? Yeah, reactor cooling pump, which, Barry, I guess that's bad, right? I don't know, it's just, I don't understand. It's just boiling water, as far as I know. But the, um, um, or I guess not boiling water, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we had to delay her, and then we pushed, pushed Nimitz out, and then we put her out the door, and then right about here, what happened? She's supposed to be coming home. Her and her, her, and her crew dads are supposed to be coming home. Syria flared up to a point where we had the crisis, and we kept them on deployment. We surged them, the, the, uh, the crew des and the carrier and the air wing, and kept them on deployment, and they just got back. Okay? The other one is the Ike. Because of this, Ike was on deployment, and then because of this reactor cooler pump, we brought her back, re-non-skidded her for Christmas. I got a ton of thank you notes. And then we pushed her out after Christmas for another four months, which is the perfect deployment length as far as I'm concerned, four months, all tax-free, by the way. And I didn't get a single thank you note on that one uh, from all the thank you notes. For but that's a function. Those are all cost drivers where, where, the, where the theory of, your, of our readiness generation machine had to be adapted because of different real-world events, in the case of Nimitz's extension, maintenance problems, cost drivers, all of them. So our FRP cycle is not as adaptable as it needs to be. Slide, please. OK, so what is the optimized FRP? It really came about starting back in November, two Novembers ago, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense Carter said, hey, how, what would it take to get four carrier strike groups out and about? The COCOMs don't really want surge, they want presence. We've been trying to trip, how many years have we been trying to tell this story, right? They want presence, right? They want to be able to respond, they're phase zero, phase one, and respond to the crisis. So how do we get four? How do we give up surge uh, and keep four out and about? And that was called the um, enhanced carrier plan. And I think uh, between OMNAV and FFC, we did the best, I, that, was a, that was a great staffing effort and came up with, we think, the best uh, uh, cost to do that. It was based on a 36-month FRP cycle where that you were going to uh, do your maintenance, train, go on deployment for seven months, have a 1.012, come home for seven months, and go back out for another seven-month deployment. Okay? So for the sunk cost of maintenance and training, get two pumps, okay? two deployments. And that had about a 48% home tempo. You're home about 48% of the time. We were generating a lot of A sub O. We didn't quite get to 4.0, but we had a lot of A sub O, a lot of forward presence. But Trip, how much stuff were we using up? Yeah, we were using a lot of stuff. We were using twice the number of deployments on our ships and our squadrons and our airplanes, and it was a pretty healthy bill that came with it. And then sequestration happened, and we didn't get another Carter letter asking about ECP. I don't know why, okay? But from what we learned from that effort is where we have developed the idea of optimized FRP. It is a 36-month FRP, okay? And it's got a single eight-month deployment in it, and we're starting with the Harry S. Truman strike group when she goes into her maintenance availability when she gets back from this deployment, and it's for her entire strike group. It has, for the sunk cost of maintenance and training, acceptable A sub O with an acceptable PERS tempo, a really good PERS tempo, okay, with a clean chain of command. Fixed strike group composition, the band is put together at the beginning of the maintenance phase. We already know who's in it. Ships and squadrons plus independent deployers and BMD ships are all going to be aligned in the Truman Strike Group. It's underneath a single chain of command, okay, for that entire three-year uh, three period. 
It's got a stable maintenance plan that is uh, in work, that the planning is ongoing. We're going after quality of service, quality of work, enhanced quality of life for our sailors. Let me spend some time there. You know, I've been a consumer most of my life, especially the last 12 years, and uh, I never heard about when I'm uh, out there on point, when I was out there in Bahrain, people were never complaining about deployment length. They had long deployment lengths. They didn't have very good port visits. It wasn't uh, glamour spots, but they were doing what they joined the Navy to do, and they were happy about it, and they were compensated pretty well between IDP and, has, and uh, tax-free, okay? I come back here. I'm working with squadrons and ships that are going through the, the workup cycle, and I don't hear about deployment length. That's not what I'm hearing. What they're were current, concerned about is the quality of life left of deployment, left of deployment. It's the maintenance. It's not, having a, it's not having a manpower. The maintenance not done right. The training not done right. So with this, we're trying to go after that, reduce the stress, improve the quality of life, quality of service left of deployment. Okay? We are embedding into the syllabus, EMMW, getting back to doing what we used to do, what we grew up with, and NIFCA, Naval Integrated Fire Control from the Air, Counter Air from the Air and from the Sea, embedded it into our warfighting culture, into our syllabus, and everybody that we train is trained to the same standard. They're trained together, and they go through an advanced phase of training that will not be called Comp 2X. We've got a special OPT deciding on what that advanced phase of training is going to be called, because none of us really know what Comp 2X stands for today. But um, an advanced phase of training where all the prerequisite training is done, and it is focused on the high-end fight. Slide, please. All right. This is not a very fancy slide. This is our layer cake slide, and it's our lines of effort that goes into um, optimized FRP. It starts at the bottom and works its way to the top. It's a calendar across the top of when we are implementing the different lines of effort of the uh, optimized FRP. As we knock down, you're getting some kneeboard cards, which has the kill channel on one side and the optimized FRP on the other. And it's filled in on what the goal is on each one of these lines of effort. On this slide that uh, no one with any eyesight, uh, with no eyesight can see, it not only has what the, what the line of effort is, it also has who has point on that line of effort. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. And we, as we lay in a piece, we're fixing it, and we, we will try it out. We will beta test something, and then we'll pick it up with the next strike group. The first is the FRP length on the very bottom, starting with Harry S. Truman, as I said. And every strike group after that will be realigned to a 36-month FRP. And when you get assigned, when a crew des gets assigned to that strike group at the beginning of that FRP, their surface force readiness manual goes to 36 months, from 32 to 36. Okay. Um, we can't do this with a flick of the switch. You'll see that it's fairly aggressive, and there's a lot of policy changes, and we're moving a lot of people around, and we have to take this one bite at a time, and we're doing it as one strike group at a time. The next one is that alignment of the strike group. We did 90% of that with a stroke of a pen. Um, right here, we're not waiting for Harry S. Truman. We started it with the Bush strike group. There'll be iterative changes, just like there is within every FRP. You won't be with the same strike group for two FRP cycles in a row, but when you get assigned one, you'll be with them for three years, okay? And PAC, Harry and Pack Fleet have moved out on it as well. The next thing is Manning. Manning, and it's Manning and individual training. You, we are, I'll show you uh, in detail on the Manning piece, what we're doing there, but that is to get 90 to 92, 90 and 92 fit fill and NEC fill coming out of maintenance. So every, every ship and squadron, will be manned to those levels when they come out of the maintenance phase, and they'll be manned during the maintenance phase for the workload that they need to do in that maintenance phase. Okay? The, um, uh, the next one on top of that is the maintenance and modernization. You'll see Willie is on point there, decoy done away for nav air, uh, for the airplane piece of this, have on point to pull across this maintenance piece. On top of that is the parts piece. On top of that, next one is the inspection process. Okay, so we've got the cycle right, we've got the chain of command right, we've got the manpower right, and the training before they get there. We get the maintenance done correctly. Now that every, we get them all the parts they need, they've been on board long enough, now we inspect them at the right time, and then we go into the unit level training, and then we go into the advanced phase of training, which as far as I'm concerned is eight phase of training. You start at one end and you end up the other one. It's one continuous training, it builds on the other. And then we go up and do the operational and tactical headquarters. Those are the layer cakes, and if you'll ever see us give IPRs on this, we go to this slide, 
and we drill down from this slide on how we're doing. This is how we are making sure that we are working. It's fairly complex. They're all intertwined, but it starts from the bottom. Slide, please. Let's go with the FRP length. Why 36 months? Because it's better than 37. The, um, uh, but it's based on, uh, that's where the carriers are today. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's a good model because it gives us what we think predictability and adaptability. It's supply-based. Now, what does supply-based mean? Supply-based means it's how, this is how much A sub O we're going to be able to generate for you. This is how much forward presence. If you want more, you've got to buy more. Okay? Now, what's important about this is that only us in the Navy are talking supply-based, right? And it will never be successful, and it only being supply-based. There's always going to be demand-based because the world gets a vote. Okay? Serious are going to happen. Crisis is going to happen. And so what needs to occur is, is that when it goes to demand-based, that we have a readiness generation model that is adaptable enough that we don't disrupt that readiness generation model and the means and the ways it goes into generating that readiness. Does that make sense? Because this is what's occurred for about the last six years. To meet the A sub O, to meet the demand cycle, we just adapted the cycles. That's why the carrier cycle is between 36 and 48. It's whatever it takes. We just, to make the A sub O, we would rewrite the entire, what we call slider for the carriers and the, and the ships. And we would just make, do whatever changes. And that drove into that, uh, that that's where predictability went out the window. So with this 36 month cycle, we're going to show you how that makes it supply based. It's going to generate, it's going to meet right now in the, with the existing force structure that we have, the 2.0 out and about, I mean, it's two carriers out and about. They're out and about doing their thing with a 27 crew devs, which is the gift map schedule between 14 and 16 based on the force structure that we have today. Um, it has a fixed maintenance cycle. You can see where the crew devs fit inside the carrier cycle. When they go through the basic, they fi finish up basic. They go through integrated together. They get a POM cycle. Last time we did a POM before deployment, we're doing it with Bush. First time we've done it in about six years, okay? And then there's an eight-month deployment, and there's a sustainment in there that we can add more A sub O should someone want to buy it, okay? In the upper right-hand corner, in font so small, I can't even see it from here, um, you have some of the uh, comparison between ECP. It's based on an eight-month cycle because we think for the long haul, an eight-month deployment is about what sailors and families can take, and it's right at the ragged edge, to be honest with you. When I came in at my first uh, 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 two at-sea periods, it was about a 24-month cycle. Uh, we had a 24-month cycle, and it was about a six-month deployment. But uh, in a three-year period, we think an eight-month is, is going to be sellable because in that time, your total time away from home uh, the total time at home is 68% of that three-year period, and that's your total time at home. That includes all your time away from home for training, for Fallon, for, uh, for group sale, for, for any time that you're out and away. We've, we know how much time uh, strike groups are out there. It's not eye tempo, but that's how long those shifts. They'll be home 68% of the time. It generates, instead of FR, uh, uh, um, ECP, it generates a .22, but the math works out and our schedule's worked out that as we transition, we'll be able to get to this. Now, I will tell you, it's going to take us a while to get to eight-month deployments. We're doing this one strike group at a time, and we're averaging eight to ten months today in carriers, uh, uh, amphibs, and BMD ships, and quite frankly, everybody is somewhere between eight and ten months, and it's closer to the nine to ten point. Okay? And that is not sustainable over the long haul. It's not going to work, so we have to come up with a new model. All right? So the bumper sticker is this, for the sunk cost of maintenance and training, Maximum A sub O with a clean chain of command and acceptable purse tempo. Okay? Slide. It's a build for me. So the, uh, go back one. You're over, too much coffee. Thank you. The, uh, it's predictable because that schedule is the schedule. Once you, once you migrate to that ECP, to this 36 month uh, FRP cycle, that's it. And we, are, we start the maintenance on time. We want it to finish on time. And you'll start your next maintenance on time. Okay? We're not changing the cycle. That's the stability in the industrial base. You know when you're going to be gone. You know how long your deployment unless the world gets a vote. Now, this is what's adaptable about it. Now you can be hyper and build it. What we can do is, 
as in the case of Nimitz, if there's a demand signal and, and we need and turns into a demand-based A sub O, we can extend you if necessary. Or if you're out here in sustainment, we can put you out here for another deployment, much like we did with Ike, get you back in on port, into maintenance on time, start your next FRP cycle on time. So it is adaptable. It will be able to accept a demand signal if we can't uh, sustain a, a, uh, a supply-based model, okay? Any questions on the FRP lanes? Okay, next slide. The alignment. I tell you, the reason the alignment's been so bad is because we haven't had the same FRP cycles. We got, we've got uh, Desrons that are training up with, uh, uh, with destroyers that are not in their Desron. They're attached to another Desron. And so we need to fix this. So by aligning everybody to the same one, aligning to choke con, I call it choke con, okay? That's fit rep con, all right? Aligning the chain of command from the strike group off, from the strike group commander on down so that everybody is now knows who their boss is. And, and this is the dirty little secret. Everybody's aligned to the same point and focused on the same point within that FRP cycle. So when they're all in maintenance, they're all in maintenance, okay? And so that, those Desrons can do what Rick Williams did for me, get me, dress me up in my flight suit and crawl through all my, all my DDGs before they're inserted through their bilges to understand what goes on in that, that necessary focus. I will tell you, every Tuesday in our battle rhythm, we do uh, our battle rhythms, future ops, uh, current ops, future plans, future ops, uh, and an assessment. But on Tuesday, we do readiness. And it's built, it is divided between the staff talks to us for a couple weeks, and I see forest. I see, you know, forest and trees things. I see forest, the TICOMs brief uh, 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 during their two-week period, uh, and I see forest and some trees. But on, uh, on the other two weeks, the strike group commanders brief, everybody in their, in their uh, strike group, and I see nothing but branches, okay? And it's very, very effective. And they are talking about everything, everybody in their strike group and how well they're, how well they're progressing, whether they're going to deploy with them, or they're an independent deployer, okay? It's gonna take change. Sure, it's gonna change. It's gonna change every FRP cycle. We're gonna have to adjust. We always do that, but uh, fixing this to the 80% solution will go a long way. Slide, please. Manning, once again, 92, 95, and one, which is 92% fit, 92% fill, and one critical NEC coming out of maintenance. You see the actions that are going in there? Billy Moran, CNP, has point on delivering this. Okay, and uh, CNO is 100% behind this, and what the CNO finds inter interesting, again, we find fascinating, right, and we are going after this. Now, this is the long pole. This is the first long pole in optimized FRP. We've got to get this manning right, and it's why we're, and we have, we're overmanned ashore, we're undermanned at sea, we have too much friction in the training pipeline, and we are going after, through a kill chain approach, fixing that, the putting the policies in place, the po necessary policy changes, the uh, necessary adjustments to seashore rotation, the incentivi incentivizing sea duty to become a sea-centric Navy again. We're, we're, we're on and running on this particular, um, on this particular effort. Uh, when we brief it at our Fleet Commander's Readiness Council every month, CMP briefs it to uh, PAC Fleet, all of the OPNAV staff, all of the CISCOMs and, uh, and myself, uh, and we have a monthly battle rhythm, and we always talk about the manning actions that'll get us there. If we could, the level of detail, if you could go to the backup slide real quick, which is, uh, 25 enter. There you go. This is the slide we'll, that we're using today, and Truman's on deployment. It's a very busy slide, but it's how we're tracking and how far out we're tracking the fit fill, NEC fill, and where they are to where they need to be so that they come out of maintenance. Okay, you can go on back. It's just an example of the fidelity that we're pulling as we pull the tribes of the manpower world, which are N1, Millington, Netsy, and the fleet. Don't ever think that we think we work for the same person. Uh, pulling them together to deliver on this particular product. Okay, absolutely critical. Sailor with the right individual training at the right time to the ship, to the squadron, with the proper training, and then we take the whole unit through the training cycle together. Rotation as we do this. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> he made you ask that question, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. You you know and and I you know I can't I can't talk about BA. I, it makes no sense to me. It makes my head hurt. Do I got them on board my ship or do I not? Okay. And uh, I believe this is BA, right? They're doing it against BA. Yeah. I will go with you on that one. I'll agree with you. Yeah. I'll agree with you on that. I'll agree with you on that. Where are we today in achieving these numbers? We don't. We're lucky to hit it a couple weeks before deployment, okay? And, uh, uh, and then we start taking them right off the ship once they go on deployment, okay? And having the wrong sailor at the wrong time. I'm going to give you a, a, a sea story. This one happens to be true, unlike anything you hear from Barry. Um, but uh, I was down visiting a, a ship on the waterfront. I forget which ship it was, Truxton, I think it was, who on an eight-month deployment dropped her anchor on her sonar dome. Okay, and she's uh, Norfolk based, but we didn't have the industrial base in Norfolk. The docks were full, and we had to, but we did down in Mayport, and we had to put her in the dock down in Mayport. Thank God we got Mayport. So they're on a long deployment. They're down in, in Mayport for four months getting their um, sonar dome fixed. I told the captain, helps not to be stupid. Um, the, uh, he, it was his line, not mine. Um, uh, and he's having his first family uh, FRG meeting, talking with the, the spouses there when they get back up to Norfolk after an eight-month deployment, four months down in Mayport. First question was from a third-class wife, uh, the, the wife of a third-class petty officer. When is my, um, my husband going to get his supervisor um, like he's supposed to have on the ship? It wasn't about a long deployment. It wasn't about uh, why did you take us off a long deployment and put us down and uh, put the ship down at Mayport? It was about not having the right leadership on the team at the right time. It's a pretty telling story. Okay, slide please. Next thing is maintenance and modernization. For, for the ships, Willie Hillardis took point on this one for the aircraft decoy did, uh, Dunaway. Uh, and it's getting the availabilities done right. And it's, it's starting at the two-year point, starting the planning correctly. And it's maintenance and modernization, both. Okay? And it's having the right people in the planning process to do maintenance and modernization. It includes a fleet scheduler during, uh, during this entire process, so we put the heat of the calendar on them. And it includes um, uh, the fleet maintenance officers, and it includes the ship. And the importance of who talks when and the prioritization of activity, the closer you get to the start of that availability, it's going to change a little bit. But at the end, when we put money down and we start funding, because we end up always funding the availabilities, uh, we, it is already prioritized. We do the planning, the planning correctly. Okay, uh, we have to get the modernization better into there. Right now, we don't. We, it's not there right now, and uh, this is an effort that has to occur. As part of the FRP cycle, I'm really worried. Uh, the one long, the long pull after Manning is the industrial base to do the availabilities inside the carrier availability. We 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 have studied that hard, but it, we cannot take our eye off of that. The industrial base has to be able to support all for the strike group, those maintenance availabilities in time the carrier strike group, uh, inside the carrier's availability timeline. Um, uh, and uh, once again, the ship will adjust its F SFRM when you, when you transition to the FRP. Stable, predictable, predictable, integrated, maintenance and modernization. That also aligns to the strike group's uh, capabilities. As we are delivering new capability in the fleet, as in the case of NIFCA, it is a full package. It's the carrier, the air wing, the crew des that are on there that have this, they all have to uh, have the right equipment. They're, 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 they all have to have the right training to deliver that capability. And in the case of NIFCA, it's fundamentally changing basic phase training. Okay, slide please. This is an example. This was off of this morning's readiness brief um, from Sir Flant, uh, the capstone and canes install. The synchronization manager of this program is right there in the center of this. This is combat, okay? Complex, capstone, really complex canes plus joint strike fighter modifications, okay? And we didn't do our planning right, okay? Anybody want to go back into there? All right? Slide, please. Spares, got to have the parts. We're going to make it work. We got to have the parts, and the parts have to be, you have to be ordered, so that we can procure them, we have to put the money against them because if we don't order today's, the parts today, not, they're not going to be here two, three, five years down. Putting great money into this. Thank you very much, Trip. 
in order to do this, we got to have the spares on the ship, and we have to have the spares on the ship at the right time in the training cycle. Because as we go through the elements of the basic and the advanced phase of training, not only the parts that are back in Norfolk or back in San Diego, if they're not on the ship and we miss a training event, we've, we will never recover that training event. Okay? We invest a lot of money in adversaries under the water, on the water, in the air, in space, and in cyberspace. And there's a lot of reps and sets. And we have to have, we have to plus up the parts so that we don't miss those training opportunities that we are investing in to get them to the right level. Okay? It's, uh, and it's really important. Everybody knows what their COSAL looks like, and, and they validate that. Okay? Slide, please. Inspections. I told CNO, if we get this right, I want my coin back. All right? In the as is, in, car in, in carriers and surface combatants, in an existing FRP cycle, there are 466 different inspections. 466. They're not aligned to any particular FRP cycle. There are multiple inspections by multiple inspection entities. Okay? Some of them, the source document that generated the requirement came from places like Sinkland Fleet. I don't even know what that is. Okay? And so we're taking a really deep dive on this to get this under control. CNO's designated FFC is the executive agent for fleet assessment. I'm the executive agent for a lot of things, which means there's no one else in charge, so please go take this and solve this particular problem, but we ask for this. And we are challenging. We've got the working groups working down. What is the inspection? What drove it? Is it being done once? Is it being done twice? And where can we focus these inspections at the right time in the FRP cycle once the sailors are on board, they've had the proper training, they've maintained it correctly, and then we do the inspection. And if, and if Pete's doing the inspection, InServe's okay with that inspection because we're inspecting to the same standards and we trust each other that we're doing it. And, we, and, there, and they we're effectively doing in-serve every FRP cycle anyway with the TICOM inspections. So uh, this is where we really want to go. And it's, uh, it shows great promise, okay? Um, I do not, I am not the uh, for uh, EA for fleet assessment for anything that has to do with a reactor plant. Funny thing, but they didn't want to give me that. I don't know why. Um, uh, but that's, that's okay given uh, how that process works within an FRP cycle, okay? Slide, please. And here's the smarter inserve. Shout out to inserve down here. We've already reduced the first inserve five to three days and, and putting operational risk management into the process, looking at more data over a broader period of time, trusting who the inspectors are, take that inspector data, and it's linked to readiness events. One of the big things in inserve is shoot all guns. And so they go out and shoot all guns, meaningless to me because the only shoot all guns that I care about is the end-to-end -end test. So here's Phil C, just through a live fire yeah, exercise. Out there. Yeah. You can track them on a... That's from another ship. Yeah, uh, Ellen looked a little behind. What do you think, Maramba? Oh! oh, oh. oh I missed that! <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Whoa! Yes, it was. But that is an end-to-end -end test. And you're not going to achieve that end-to-end -end test unless the captains shoot all guns every time they get an opportunity. But the only one that I want to inspect to is that sort of test, that the end-to-end -end kill chain worked and that gun fired and it put a warhead on a forehead fused when it needed to. Slide, please. All right. Okay. Training. You know, we are really... We are really merging basic and advanced phase of training. I, Pete, Pete, everybody knows my TICOMs on my coast know not to say, hey, we're through basic phase because it's all got to build. It's a training continuum that builds on the previous training, okay? And uh, we're going to train everybody to the, uh, train everybody to the same standard because when we push them out the door, east coast or west coast, we don't know where they're going to fight. They just got to fight and win, do the nation's bidding, ready on arrival when they get there, okay? And that's the high-end fight, all right? Um, we, have, we understand the entitlements. I don't like the term entitlement, um, but the things that you need to do that we know you need to do, whether it's ordinance, range, parts, whatever it happens to be, uh, aligned. And a part of that entitlement um, is that the time is there, okay? So the Sea Lord wanted six months for basic phase, and he kept beating me down. He was sending me notes, post-it notes, calling me all hours. I caved six, uh, uh, six I mean, uh, uh, what is it? 
24, yeah, that's six months. Anyway, so we caved on it, so the time is there. But another piece of this, we're going to be training a lot of ships at the same time through that cycle. And a, and a resource they need are trainers. Okay? So we, have to, so we have to synchronize it so that the trainers are there and everybody gets the reps and sets with the proper uh, training and oversight that happens to be there. And then they're assessed at the right time. Basic, uh, the, uh, the group sale is a scripted event now. I'm telling you, it's a syllabus and it's a scripted event to prepare people for the advanced phase of training of Comp2X. No longer do strike group commanders get to go out and just decide what they're going to do. It is a scheduled event and, and it is, uh, once again, it's to prepare them, properly prepare them to, uh, for the advanced phase of training. We do two DG sets now. One in that basic phase and one at the advanced phase. Um, invest in that in necessary investment to make sure that we can talk and squawk and share the picture together uh, correctly. Okay? Slide, please. Lastly is the operational and tactical alignment. Standardizing at the, at the high level, at the naval component commander's level, at the numbered fleets, to the task force level, that the task force is done correctly, that the strike group staffs are done correctly, that the warfare commander staffs are trained correctly, all to the same syllabus to the same standards and a training track for all of the key leadership. We just put the strike group commanders, peace strike group commanders, through the beta test of, a, of, a, um, of their uh, uh, training track before going out to deployment. I mean, mine was a half-day visit to naval reactors to say not to take the nuke into New York City and don't fire the reactor officer. I, I didn't need a half-day visit to be told that. So um, a far more structured, we had uh, the next strike group commander on Bush, out on Bush for COM2X for three weeks. Everybody gets a come to X. Okay. Slide, please. Okay, here's the timeline. Here's the timeline that we're implementing these things into. Uh, and once again, as soon as we're ready to go, we either beta test it and put it in so that we can adapt it for the next for the next uh, uh, strike group that goes through there. Slide, please. Here's how they align in the uh, uh, FRP cycle. What's important to note is that there's a lot of the whole kill chain is aligned in a lot of these issues. I can't fix manning in the fleet. I can't fix maintenance just in the fleet. We need to go all the way back to the resourcing, to the policy issues on many of these things in order to fix the optimized FRP. So if you're a member in a kill chain, you are either a product of readiness, you're a producer of readiness, or you're a consumer of readiness. You all know where you are, where you are, and how you're going to help us with the optimized FRP. Slide, please. And finally, this is on the back of your kneeboard card. Those are the elements that we call the, uh, the, the lines of effort that happen to be out there and our, and our goal, our end state for each one of those lines of effort. Slide, please. Floor is open for your questions. Another awesome picture from that uh, COM2X. Yes, ma'am. Afternoon, sir. Um, Lieutenant Commander Jean Marie Sullivan, uh, Special Assistant to CNO. Um, my question goes back to the supply based, demand based. You talked about um, real world events get a vote, but often the COCOMs have no incentive to not ask for the world in terms of what they need from the Navy. And is there any effort underway or thoughts about how do we? Sort of because we have to keep providing, providing, providing presence. Um, how does that get balanced in terms of demand from the COCOM and what we're able to? Well, provide? it's the Secretary of Defense that does that balancing, and he does it for through a process that the Global Force Management process, the GFM process, is actually a supply based model. Every year, the Secretary of Defense uh, signs off and deploy and uh, on what each one of the services is able to produce in a 365 day period for the next year. That is a supply based. The part that's not supply based is the RFF process and that's where we need some discipline in um, because that's demand based. That's in addition to that's out there. And within the process there is a there is a, uh, uh, a force allocation decision model that has a matrix in it that we worked real hard on when Jay Paxson were on, and I were on the joint staff together, and we're really happy not to be there, um, uh, that builds into that fathom the prioritization of not only location, but the health of the force, long-range health of the force. We have, to use that fi we have to use that fathom that happens to be out there. And um, uh, 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 it's not the COCOM's fault that, uh, that they're asking for capability. They are given end states and um, they have to meet those end states. They own the risk 
if they fail, okay? And so we need to, us as force providers need to understand um, risk to mission, which is what the COCOM has to understand. And the COCOMs also need to have to understand risk to the long-term health of the force, which is the service chief. And we have, and the, so the COCOM staffs and, and the service staffs have to work together to understand that. Um, what is acceptable risk to mission? What is acceptable long-term risk to the force? And it's a dialogue that we have to occur, that has to occur. That said, the world will still always get a vote. And so if we don't come up with a model that when the world gets a vote, or say the secretary votes against long-term health of the force because he thinks it's important, then we don't want to have to break our force generation model, and we think that will answer the, answer the question. Okay? You know, risk is an interesting question. Um, who owns risk? We say that a lot. Well, we can accept that risk. I'm going to give you my philosophy on who owns risk, okay? And, it's, and um, I know the Social Security numbers of everybody that owns risk. The first is John Greenert's Social Security number, and the second are the combatant commanders, and in the Navy's case, the naval component commanders that are out there. They own the risk. We don't own risk, okay? If, if, if naval forces fail, they're the ones that are responsible. Cobar Towers, who talked? COCOM commander or the, or the chief of staff of the Air Force? Cole, who talked to Congress? Was it the chief of, uh, was it the, um, C, uh, was it the COCOM or was it the chief of naval operations? Service chiefs own that risk. They know it, okay? Um, the other thing, so you got to be real careful about risk. So when I talk to my staff, when we talk about what's acceptable risk, I say, who owns that risk, and did we ask them? The other thing about risk is it's really important. In my mind, it's not risk unless there's a memorial service potentially involved. Okay? That, that's real risk there. If, you're gonna, if someone's going to have to speak at a memorial service, that's real risk. If no one's going to have to speak there, it's not risk. It's not risk to career. It's not that. Those are the things. You've got to be able to define risk, put it in the right context. Next question, please. Good afternoon, Admiral. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Vandroff. I'm at uh, the Naval Sea Systems Command. I was curious. Uh, you mentioned clean you were chain. You're curious to find out you're in charge of some of this, aren't you? I, I, yeah. I, I would be what you would call a provider of readiness. There you are. The, uh, I, I provide my favorite kind of readiness. I'm the DDG-51 new construction program manager. I love my product. Uh, the, and so my question is related to that product. You talked about clean chain of command uh, and standardized training across the carrier strike group, but you also talked about that for independent deployers. A and in the future, and I think we're seeing now in the future, a lot of ships, specifically DDGs, are going to be out independently on BMD stations. Are you including, is there somewhere in that clean chain of command and standardized training for the individual deployers, how do you maintain their clean chain of command and standardized training while making sure that they're ready for their specific and particular mission yeah. that could be different from the rest of the carrier strike group as you move through the optimized fleet replacement plan? Yeah. Um, they're part of that carrier strike group. So when we train uh, non-FDNF forces, CODIS-based forces are part of their uh, a part of that um, uh, uh, carrier strike group, and they move through that FRP cycle with the rest of the strike group. They know who their boss is. They're trained to the same standards as the carrier strike group. They're also going to be given the additional training that they're going to need if it's a unique unique mission, be it a be it a BMD ship or a Scan Eagle deployment uh, for uh, for Africom. But they're going to move through that particular cycle. And with the Ford on the East Coast, with the Ford deploy of the Ford Rota, we're able to make that work. We're also working on an optimized FRP. Uh, we started just last week when we realized the need for FDNF forces. What does their FRP look like? It's not going to look like this FRP, but all the pieces, they have to have the same level of pieces that happen to be out there, unique to their, unique to their particular Ford deployed location. And so we started that effort as well. Um, uh, I will tell you, um, the, uh, I thought when I was told to come up with an idea back as a one star, as the three and the five, come up with an idea to generate more forward presence for our crew devs. So we came up with the idea, we saw where we thought we had some excess capacity, 
and we came up with the idea of GWAT Surge, the independent deployers. And it was a great idea. We changed it to MSO Surge. It was a great idea. We can generate more forward presence and um, uh, for less cost and generate more forward presence. And so we did that. It was a terrific idea until I was a Naval Component Commander and I had 60% of my force were these GWAT Surge ships and they had not gone through an advanced phase of training. Not a very good idea. I'm not going to do that again because if they go out the door, this isn't the Southcom, this isn't a FIG uh, or a Joint High Speed Vessel to Southcom. If they go out the door, they got to be able to fight and win wherever they go and they got to be able to fight and win on, re on, on arrival. And so that's why aligning them and going through that advanced phase of training. When Rick and I were out at Fifth Fleet together, we actually broke out our crew deses of everybody that deployed to us who had gone through a Comp 2X and who did not. And we apportioned mission accordingly. Okay? Hope that answered your question. And we love your product. Thank you. Next question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Chief Bradshaw. Um, first, I have a question, but first I have a statement. I'm not sure if you intended with a comment that you made. When you differentiated, you said officers and sailors. It kind of sends a mixed signal because I think we're all sailors okay. at the end of Good the day. Good point. Now, for my question. Now, <laughs> <laughs> as far as the FRR, your FRP is concerned, we speak about uh, the Desrons and the strike groups but very little about our ARGs and MUs, our AMFIP guys. Okay. Um, is there a similar plan set up for them also? Yep. Well, first off, let me talk to your comment <laughs> because I say officers and sailors because as we align the manning to the ships from the FRP, they have different policies, career path rotations, and we have to come up with a model that fits off, uh, uh, the sailors, our chiefs, and our officers. That's why we say it the way we do. I'm a sailor. I got salt, I love salt water. The only person that likes salt water more than me is Buzz Busby, okay? <laughs> All right? Sir. Okay. And I like salt air more than he does. Okay, so um, uh, we started with the carrier strike group because that's 85% of our Navy. Uh, we are now in work with the ARG Muse because we couldn't, do, we, have to, we have to do the ARG Muse in lockstep with the Marine Corps. We can't come up with an FRP cycle that the, that the, MU can't, that the Marine Corps can't support, if that makes sense. It's got to be that team. So we're in that effort, and the key piece is starting at the, at the bottom layer cake, the first layer of the layer cake, and that's the FRP cycle. Everything else that you see on the left side of those lines of effort match to the, what we do for the ARGMU. The personnel, the parts, the manning, the maintenance, the modernization, that's already in work, but we first have to get that FRP length correct with the Marine Corps, and we're working real close, with, we're working hand in hand with MARFORCOM on that one. We're also doing it for our MPA. Um, we have to make sure the MPA is right, and we have to do it for our, uh, our, our, our submariners, our submarine force, make sure we get that right. And again, I talked to about our FDNF force for each area of our FDNF force. We have to figure out what does their FRP look like, what are those parts of the layer, are we doing it correctly? Okay? Thanks, Chief. Next question, please. I know I'm standing between you and the Sea Lord putting money on the bar. I know that. Good afternoon, Admiral. Chief Petty Officer Brakebill with the uh, Aegis Training and Readiness Center down in Dahlgren. Got a question. Uh, you mentioned a 68% home port tempo, and you said that was in port at home. That's correct. And, and schoolhouses. And a schoolhouse. And the way I look at it, if you're using a 36-month FRP, that's 22% or eight-month deployment is 22% of that time. So that leaves you a 10% gap. So how are you going to squeeze in unit-level training in serve underways, all the training that goes into your FRP okay. into that 10%. Let me give you uh, what I need is, uh, Mark, get his <coughs> email address. You got a Cipernet account? Yes, sir. Okay, we will show you our fishbone. We call it the fishbone of everything within that FRP cycle, all of the time that we account for time away from home, for our crew des, uh, specifically for, for, for our crew des for you and for the carrier and the squadrons that comes up with that number. All right. Thank we, you, sir. Yep. Slide. Next question. Uh, Admiral Rick Easton. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of AVT Simulation. Um, I don't want to use the word risk, but what are the things that you are most concerned about that will sub-optimize your optimized FRP plan? First one is manning. Okay. 
we have to get the manning right, and we get to get the manning levels right. And when we do that, as we move sailors uh, uh, of uh, uh, sailors from shore to sea, we have to make sure that we do the manpower scrub ashore correctly. We're prioritizing our our maintenance and our trainers ashore at the same level as we are to deployed assets. We don't want to empty out our maintenance and our schoolhouses in order to do that. So the manning's got to work, and you can see to, to get that work, the re, do we have the right number of sailors with the right training? Uh, uh, is that going to work? The next thing is the training for those sailors. I can get them there, but if, I, if their schoolhouses aren't correct and they're not being taught what they need to be taught in their training pipeline, um, I, I have to do that training on the waterfront. Okay, the TICOMs have to do that particular training is the next piece. If you're in simulation, I think we are woefully under-resourced in surface warrior simulation on the waterfront. It's one of the Sea Lord's key initiatives in order to do that. Um, to be able to do that, we have to, it's fairly inexpensive and it's huge return on investment. This is coming from an aviator uh, who's been doing it all his, all his life. Um, so uh, uh, the, the next one, again, is uh, can we get the maintenance done correctly? You know, um, uh, you saw what WASP is like, right? And uh, I have to adjust the GFM schedule. She won't. She she will make her deployment on time with her proper training. We have time in the schedule to do that. Um, but uh, uh, it's not going to be a flick of the switch. Uh, and I have to work my way through in order to do. In or we have to work our way through the challenges that are come up to get the maintenance right. And the industrial piece, uh, in order to inside the maintenance phase of that FRP for that entire strike group, we have to micromanage it. You know, there's a fine line between micromanagement and thorough oversight, depending on where you live in the food chain. And um, uh, we'll be micromanaging it. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you, Admiral. From a retired captain's perspective, I think I've seen more structure than I have ever seen, counting my entire career and my civilian last seven years. So. So uh, well done to the guys that put this together. Thanks. It was a great staff effort, both PAC Fleet, FFC, and OPNAV, uh, and the TICOMs in order to do it. I will tell you, though, um, when I look at it, we go back a slide, and we look at the layers of the, of the wedding, uh, the layer cake, um, only the very top, I think, is really new. Uh, everything else, we got away from. Um, and like in most things, you know, we need to, if we're going to move away, if we're going to move away for something, clearly understanding what the problem, why are we moving it away, are we creating a second or third order effect is important. 